SCP-2951, 10,000 years. There are a lot of naturally scary places in our world, such as dark woods, cemeteries, the circus, and for many people, mines, especially abandoned mines. With risks of poisonous gases, cave-ins, sudden drops, and tight confines, people have plenty of reasons to be wary of old mines. This is the SCP universe we're talking about, though, so there's even more reason to be scared. Ooh. Which brings us to SCP-2951. In the real world, mines are abandoned for a variety of reasons, but an SCP mine is abandoned for really only one reason. Things got really weird. SCP-2951 is an abandoned limestone mine in Indiana, originally owned by the B.G. Hoadley Mining Group until 1944, when an incident led to its closure. The primary entrance of the mine collapsed during that incident and is currently inaccessible, but a secondary shaft located in a dilapidated storage building remains accessible. The interior of the mine is subject to irregular spatial and temporal anomalies, as well as the presence of unknown entities, believed to be connected to the 1944 incident. Ooh. The Foundation's information on the incident was taken from files collected from the personal office of J. Howard Barnes, an informant for the GOC, and an administrator for the Curvier Corporation, a company involved with various anomalous mining operations. On August 23, 1944, seismic activity was detected below the Lemon Quarry, prompting supervisors to send a team into the mine to assess the damage. Three hours later, the team returned and reported that an important access tunnel had collapsed. A larger team of workers was assembled to clear the debris out, but while working, additional seismic activity occurred, which is noted as being unusual for the area. Another okay. tunnel collapsed behind the workers, this trapping the crew. Intriguing. Over the next several hours, teams worked on both sides of the collapse to help rescue the trapped crew. And when the crew was freed, they reported that a new tunnel had been opened during the activity, one not made by the miners. This new tunnel had not been charted by the mining corporation, so a small team was sent in to explore it. The tunnel was described as cut smooth, but not unnaturally so, and descends at a slight decline. Supervisors believe that this tunnel was an original access tunnel cut by the mine's original owners, and was not properly recorded. A team of 23 men were sent into the tunnel in the hopes that it would loop back around behind the original blockage, allowing them to assess the damage from the other side. Little else was noted after that team was sent in, although there was another round of seismic activity, causing the primary entrance to collapse. Oh God, Teams though. above ground worked over Jesus the next Christ. three days to clear the rubble at the entrance, while others tried to contact the missing team using telephone cables run down the secondary entrance. On the evening of the shaking. third day, just as the administrators of the mine were preparing to request assistance from other nearby mining groups, an individual emerged from the secondary shaft. The only note of this event is a telegraph that was sent to the offices of the mine administrators. It reads... Mine abandoned. Tunnels remain collapsed. 23 lost. One of them came up the shaft. We tossed it back down. Wasn't right. They tossed him After back? that incident, what? the mine was left to sit for 44 years until 1998. Wait, 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 wait. Are you telling me they sent 23 down, one motherfucker came back, but they were like, mm -mm, he ain't right, son. Something wrong with him. And they threw him back in the tunnel? What? Dude, I was just like, just imagine if nothing were like, I mean, obviously something had to be like strange with it. Like otherwise, what the fuck, right? Like why would you ever throw an innocent person in a tunnel? Or back in a tunnel, or is it even worse, honestly? Just imagine being in one of the tunnels, right? And you get a little bit dusty and a little bit like, oh, spooked and scared and whatnot. You come out the end of the tunnel, all the other tw 22 members, they're gone. And uh, the people that's find you are like, you look a bit strange today, don't you? Yeah, let's toss you back in the tunnel, dude. I would, I would kill people. I'm not joking. Plus seismic activity inside a tunnel. Look, I'm not like claustrophobic or anything. 
Like, I, I'm not, I'm not. It, I think tunnels are kind of cool to some degree. But seismic activity inside a tunnel? How about no, sir? How about no, thank you? Don't like that. Don't like that even one bit. It is terrifying to even consider. On June 4th, 1998, low-level seismic activity was detected near a foundation site, and a team of foundation geologists were sent to investigate. They were unable to pinpoint the epicenter of the disturbance, and simply left several seismographs in nearby towns to detect aftershocks. Two weeks later, a missing persons report was filed with local police for a Tevin Napier, a 15-year-old student who had disappeared after he and his friends had been trespassing in the abandoned Lemon Quarry. Teams searched the quarry, eventually discovering the secondary access shaft underneath the maintenance building, which was now unsealed. A search and rescue team began a descent into the shaft, expecting to find the boy's body, but had to postpone the search due to requiring longer equipment, as the shaft was simply too deep. The original recorded depth of the shaft was around 120 meters, but the rescue crew estimated the depth to be around 240 meters. Ooh, so it grew Eventually, after getting longer equipment, the rescue crew descended to the bottom of the shaft, but failed to find the boy's body. While well, down there, however, they quickly reported feeling agitated and a feeling of doubt about their perception of the mine. The five-man crew occasionally reported there being seven or eight members of the team, and one member said that they were here to look for gold. 43 minutes after entering, oh, the team me. stopped responding oh to radio communications. My camera shut off. Jesus Christ, that scared the shit out of me. Apologies, apologies. The camera shut off. I don't know. I don't know if the battery is broken or something but it i don't know it just shut off all of a sudden apologies if i scared you too i didn't mean to jesus christ man talking about caverns spooky stuff going on dark and then my camera shuts off dude i jumped i'm not gonna lie i jumped a little bit i apologize and uh, sorry and so the above ground team began to retract the tethers however they began retracting far more rope than had been sent down and after retracting 400 meters of rope the winch was no longer able to take any more. This is, of course, the point where the Foundation comes in, taking control of the rescue operations under the guise of a federal search and rescue team. They used a far more powerful winch system and were able to retrieve two of the five men, still attached to their tethers. The first man became increasingly agitated and violent, still convinced he was in the mine, while the second man was initially thought to be comatose. After 20 minutes, the second man began speaking unintelligibly, but others said that the voice he was speaking in was not his own, but that of another rescue member still in the mine. Of the three other ropes, two returned with clean cuts at the end, and the third was covered with human blood for 13 meters, and appeared to have been cut with a jagged rock. The Foundation administered amnestics to all civilians involved in the operation, and spread a cover story about what had occurred in the mine. The mine was then classified as SCP-2951, and an exploration was approved. Dude, this is fucking cool. Oh, I'm such a nerd. The exploration was carried out by MTF Trotter 5, Hell's Heroes, a four-man team. Their goal was to further assess the nature of 2951 and to locate the lost search and rescue members as well as the missing teenager. They went in through the secondary shaft and were to only stay in the mine for 40 minutes. The team descends 120 meters down the shaft, reaching the bottom, despite the search and rescue team reporting the depth to be 240 meters. They don't find much evidence of the rescue team here aside from footprints, which they begin to follow. T5-2 is tasked with keeping track of time, reporting every 10 minutes that they're down there. They find lines in the wall from where the tether ropes rubbed against the rock, but only two lines. Sometime later, T5-2 reports that they've been down there for 10 minutes, which surprises T5-1, who feels that they've been down there for longer. As they make their way through the secondary access shaft, the close confines force them into a single file line, and sometime later, T5-2 says that they've been down there for 17 minutes. 
T5-1 confirms that that number really isn't right, suggesting that a temporal anomaly is at work. The team sees a light in the distance, and hears something deep below them, possibly more seismic activity, but T5-5 says that definitely isn't right. The team hastens their pace toward the light to avoid a cave-in, with T5-4 suggesting that perhaps the light belongs to the lamps of the lost rescue members. Perhaps they're like eyes T5-6 of creature. asks what the time is, and T5-2 says they're still at 17 minutes. The team begins to bicker as a panic rises, and their problems grow as the tunnel seems to shrink around them and their lights go out. T5-5 mentions multiple times that something is deep below them, but T5-1 calms the team down and ignites a lighter. They notice that the tunnel they're in is blocked, and apparently has been for a while. T5-2 notes that the time is at 13 minutes, which is certainly not correct. But T5-1 only says that they've been down there too long already. Multiple I've members agree that days. they've been down there for too long, as they continue down a smaller separate tunnel. Dude, this is so cool. I love it so much, dude. Oh my god. What a great SCP. Dude, look, 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 look. It has all this fat, dude. Oh my god. This is cool as shit. Now, I'm not really big into like caves and stuff, but caves like this, Oh my god, sign me up, dude. Anomalies happening, we don't really know what's going on. There's temporal anomalies, there's spatial anomalies, there's illusions and mental, uh, what do you call it, changes. In things that you can't really predict, you can't really uh, fully grasp. After some time, they emerge into the main access shaft, but T5-4 acts suddenly surprised at T5-3's existence. T5-2 says that there were only four of them, and then T5-6 says that there were only four of them. Multiple gunshots are then heard as T5-5 repeats too long in the fire over and over. T5-3 notes that they're wearing the team's uniforms, and one is on fire before it violently combusts. Following the events of the log, the MTF was removed from the access shaft and given a thorough examination. T5-1, 3, and 4 suffered minor lacerations and burns, and T5-2 received more serious injuries. The remains of the unknown entities were also pulled out, each wearing the same uniform as the rest of the team, and they were confirmed to have been mimicking the voices of the other team members. Combining this with the low lighting and tight quarters led the team to fail to distinguish how many were with them during the exploration. In a follow-up interview with T5-3, a doctor asks him to confirm the anomalous passage of time. 3 says that he's been in similar situations before, and thinks that they might have been down there for 4 hours. The team's logging equipment was active for 5 and a half hours total but to the personnel above ground, they were only in the mine for 19 minutes. Three says that the experience was very disorienting, like your mind starts to feel like soup, and you can't recall if something happened even if it just did. When asked oh. about the unknown entities, Three remains confused on how they had managed to get a hold of this copies awesome. of their uniforms and equipment, even the name badges with the identification scorched off. This is Three boring. says that they were mostly single file, and it was very hard to tell what was happening down there, initially blaming the acoustics on why he heard someone's voice behind him, despite the person being in front of him. Three asks about the teenager, who is still missing, and T5-2, who still hasn't said anything about the ordeal. The doctor asks if Three wants an amnestic, but he refuses it, saying that if he's still dreaming about that thing, screaming at him with his own voice in a month, he'll take one. Following these events, the Foundation began to try and track down information about the mine, specifically records from the BG Holdley Mining Group. This proved difficult, however, as the company had closed down 40 years prior, and the potentially anomalous nature of the Curvier Corporation made accessing their records tricky. 
The foundation did, however, manage to make contact with a Mr. Gorman P. Ellis, a retired investigator for B.G. Holdley. Ellis proved to be cooperative during the foundation interview, and although he initially says he never worked at Lemon Quarry, he goes on to say that he did spend some time there. He had gone in with a team to clean up the mining operation after it was shut down, and notes how strange it was that there had been earthquakes at all in the mine. He also remarks on the strangeness of an out-of-state company like Curvier coming in and buying a small abandoned mine like Lemon Quarry. Ellis is the one that suggests the Foundation get a hold of J. Howard Barnes, who they recover most of the information on the mine from. Ooh, so this actually might be another SCP group then. Ah, that makes actually a little bit of sense too. But boy, I feel bad for the kid. Dude, if it's 19 minutes recorded five and a half hours down there, 19 minutes. Imagine being down there for like, I don't know, two days. Dude, that's literally, the boy has been down there for like two months, straight up. The interview ends with Ellis mentioning that the cleanup job was peculiar because even though there were a dozen men with Ellis's team, another dozen or so from Curvier and five or six men from BG Holdley, he doesn't think that even one of the others spoke to them the entire time they were there. Speaking of J. Oh. Howard Barnes, in addition to the records collected from his office, the Foundation also discovered a few pieces of relevant, personal correspondence that had been sent to him. The first, from a man named Trent, tells Barnes that there had been an incident at the mine, trapping 20 or so men. He figures that Barnes should know so he can contact the company's lawyers. Another man writes Barnes and says that a bunch of men in suits showed up in the mine asking about the cave-in. He doesn't know if they're lawyers or not, but they asked strange questions about wanting to listen to the rocks. An employee of Curvier International wrote to Barnes, informing him that their company has just purchased the mine and they are interested in any information he might have on it. The final piece of correspondence is unlabeled but the writer tells Barnes that he saw something that was like a man crawl out of the hole at the mine. It smoked and burned and cried out in someone else's voice, and they say it was a thing pulled straight from the pit itself. They write that another man had said that the pillars that support the world will crack and crumble, and the foundation will become loose. What lies below will become accessible and its might will fall upon the meek. The writer says that they saw this with their own eyes and know it is the true. Meek. They can still it's hear like the a, thing's words like screaming words? like a wild dog. 10,000 years in the fire. The final addendum is a letter that Gorman Ellis wrote prior to his death in 2003, discussing the mine with an unknown recipient. I remember there was one SCP uh, that we listened to that was sort of about death and how that when you died it was like and you, you were sentenced to hell essentially where you it wasn't that you were just tortured but your capacity for pain increased with you now, i don't remember the scps somebody in chat might now nah, surely this can't be a gateway there no nah, i think i'm wrong about that no nah, i think this is like something else but it seems to be like a hellish environment and something that's common over and over again is burning pe people who are burning and these weird entities. It nearly sounds like the underworld. Ellis writes that 23 poor boys got stuck behind that wall during the collapse in 1944 and they could hear them shouting for days while the rest of them did nothing. Ellis discusses what it's like to be in a mine during a blackout when your eyes try to adjust to the dark around you but there's nothing to adjust to because there's no light. Then you start to hear things that aren't there. Voices or animals or any number of things. Some will wander and get lost. Some will fall into a shaft or crevice. And then it gets real quiet. He also mentions the tunnel that they had found before the collapse. The uncharted one that was cut smooth. Ellis says that it didn't look dug by tools and he doesn't know what's down there. He finishes by writing that he hasn't thought much about hell, but he thinks that they deserve it, because whatever happens to those missing men was their fault for doing nothing, and the dark changes people. 
Oh my god. So, long story short, it's not a portal to hell in the conventional sense. No. Yeah. Although what people go through that get trapped down there could be described as hell. The anomaly inside of the mind changes, warps the trapped individuals, leaving little behind of their former selves. In an attempt to become freed, the anomaly copies the clothing and voices of those that enter the mine, but so far it hasn't been especially effective, as the entities are now far from human. As I said, abandoned mines are creepy and risky places for a lot of reasons in real life, but sure. the SCP universe really ramps things up. Being trapped in a dark mine shaft could make a day feel like a week, but being trapped in an anomalous mine shaft could make a day feel like 10,000 years. Oh, that's why it's called 10,000 years. Ah, I see. All right, let's get the quote. That man from Geist said as much himself, that the pillars that support the world will crack and crumble, and the foundation will become loose. What lies below will become accessible, and, it, and its might will fall upon the meat. I saw it with my own eyes. I know it is true. I still hear its words, Jeremiah. Ten thousand years. Screaming like a wild dog. Shrieking like it was cornered. Ten thousand years in fire. In the fire. I don't know why, but the meek part stood up. That like really came out. Because I know it's like a, I know it's like a religious quote, isn't it? I believe it's originally like the meek will inherit the earth. SCP-2951, 10,000 years. I'm guessing then that the 10,000 year part is uh, alluding to the, the, the extreme time scales that you, uh, what should we say, that you live when you're down in these monstrous caves. So with its strong correlation to hell, I was considering that maybe it was that uh, it had something to do with SCP that um, where you were, essentially it's like hell, you're tortured forever, but also your capacity to feel pain increases. So it's just like this inevitable, like this never ending spiral of torture and pain. Now I, I will retract that. I don't think it is anymore. After listening to it, it doesn't seem like it. Uh, it might still be, but uh, I'm gonna say no, possibly not. All in all, great SCP. I think it was wonderful. Uh, very scary, very spooky. Uh, loved it, very mysterious. Uh, it is definitely one of the better SCPs that we have encountered, but I think it's mostly due to how like weird it is. At the end, we kind of get this hint that there is like these entities trying to leave. Now I'm thinking like, Maybe these entities are like just humans who have been down there for 10,000 years, you know, in, in the, the time scale of the cave. Oh, and it gives me the, the heebie-jeebies there that they copy other people, like fully down to the nameplate. That is also terrifying. But yes, I think we're gonna end it here though, regardless. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this SCP. I certainly did. I thought it was great. Absolutely astonishing. Um, also, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Alrighty, peace.